Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's panel on diversity and inclusion. I believe that this is the world's first hybrid panel discussion for diversity and inclusion, which is a fairly big claim. I'm sure there'll be someone tweeting me in a moment to say that's not the case, but we are very proud to be together in person to be able to bring this discussion to you this afternoon. My name is Vanessa Lovett and I work at Glissa, which is the virtual platform that you are watching us through at the moment. And I'll come back to Glissa shortly because really why we've got to together today is to make sure that we keep momentum going when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Momentum was gathering during 2019, and in spite of global lockdowns, has really continued to grow in force as a result of multiple world events so far this year. But as we move into what is likely to be a period of restructuring for many businesses, as furloughing draws to a close for countries across the world, it's possible that companies will see this as not a number one priority any longer and might prioritize other more pressing challenges. However, you don't have to look very far to know why diversity is important to companies and to be able to find statistics that prove that gender diversity leads to better results, if ethnicity and diversity leads to better results. And that's why we're having this conversation today to really try to make sure that we keep the momentum and the progress going. Before we crack into the session, there are three things three people and three companies that I would really like to draw attention to that have made today's session possible. So first, I mentioned Glissa, and this is how we came about with this event in the first place. Instead of a LinkedIn post or a tweet or something on social media to show that we feel that the Black Lives Matter movement is important, instead we've decided that we are going to give Glissa away. We are going to give our virtual and hybrid event platform away to diversity and inclusion professionals within companies so that they can use it to continue these crucial conversations and meetings in their own businesses. And we're really proud to do that. We felt that it was something that we could do to keep these conversations going. As well as that, we are in a fantastic venue in central London. I have to say it was pretty awesome to be able to come and be here in person for a change instead of just simply looking at another uh, video call from my desk. And we must thank etc. Venues for allowing us to be in their wonderful county hall venue today. And it takes more than a great tech platform and a beautiful venue to pull this together. We also needed a very, very well-skilled team of audio vision audio visual technicians and uh, video streaming internet experts. And we have one of the best in the business, Love Days AV, who have very kindly bought a brilliant team and a lot of technical equipment to make this happen today. I really can't thank them enough. And I think it really demonstrates both etc. Venues and Love Days AV's commitment to diversity and inclusion as well. And talking of people who are committed, this is the perfect time for me to introduce the rest of our panel because we have some brilliant people to share their thoughts with us today. I'm going to do a very quick introduction to them and then ask them to introduce this themselves as well. So if I start right from the other end of our panel, we have Ashanti Benu, and Ashanti is an extremely well-versed professional when it becomes to racial diversity and also is an events expert to boot. So we have a sort of double whammy in the shape of Ashanti. We have Manny Sembi, who's joined us from Etc. Venues, and she is their vice president of sales and has a very good understanding of how meetings particularly are crucial to continuing important conversations within businesses. We have Darren Edgar, and Darren is uh, a bit of a tech whiz um, in the tech sector. Software as a service is very much her area of expertise and a really staunch advocate of promoting women in the tech sector too. And then joining us virtually, so logging in um, remotely as our virtual panelist, we have Crystal Cairo, who is a senior 
diversity consultant from EY, and indeed will be using Glissa actually to run her own DNI events coming up in the future too internally. So on that note, I'm going to now hand back and ask each of you to introduce yourself in a little bit more detail um, and also why you decided to get involved today. So if I could start with Ashanti and hand over to you. Lovely. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Ashanti. I am a diversity and inclusion practitioner, but I specialise in helping organisations have one of the most difficult conversations there are to have in the workplace, that of race, essentially. Um, and so what we do is we create brave spaces um, as opposed to safe spaces within organisations that allow um, leadership and senior managers to open up uh, a conversation about race and how they're able to engage um, ethnic minorities in, in the workplace. Thank you. Manny. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Manny Senby, Director of Sales for Etc Venues. Um, firstly, delighted to be hosting the session here at County Hall. Um, and from a personal perspective, um, as a female Asian within the events industry, um, really proud to be sat here along um, fellow colleagues. Um, so yeah, great to be here. Um, but in terms of my background, I've been with Etc Venues for a number of years. And my background is mainly managing sales teams, diverse sales teams in London, Birmingham, and most recently in New York. Um, but a passionate sub a subject that I'm incredibly passionate about. So yeah, great to be here. Thank you. And Darren? Hi, I'm Darren Edgar, and I've been in the technology industry for a number of years, and now I focus on growing technology businesses using partnerships and alliances. Um, over the years, I've also launched and led a number of diversity initiatives uh, for a number of different large organizations, as well as independently in uh, technology ecosystems. And one of the things I focus on is bringing those initiatives closer to the core business of the company and closer to the customers and how they can benefit from what those programs bring to employees as well as customers and partners. So thinking a little bit about you know, what Glisser's offer is, that's why today is quite important to me, is how we can use what Glisser does with what ETC does in the world of hybrid events and offer up possibilities to keep those conversations going, as well as keep them going in a way that benefits our customers' businesses, our partners' businesses, and our employees' day-to-day -day experiences. Great. Thank you. And Crystal, if we could bring Crystal in remotely, that would be wonderful. We'll just give a moment. Hi, Crystal. If you could. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? Great. Thank you. It's so good to have <laughs> you with us. Well, thank you for uh, setting up all the technology so I'll still be able to join today, even though I'm not in the UK. I'm, um, I am based in the Netherlands, uh, based in Amsterdam. So uh, also for me, very uh, good to be here and happy to see not all, only floating heads like I have for the past couple of months, but actually <laughs> to see you guys being there physically together. It's uh, a yeah, really great energy and happy to see that it's going to be possible again. <laughs> uh, but a little bit about me, well, I work as a senior consultant diversity and uh, From my role, I am responsible for embedding, really embedding the DNI agenda into um, the work our leaders do specifically. Uh, I work for 18 different markets or 18 different countries uh, spread throughout mostly Western Europe. And uh, yeah, from my role, it's we, we really support our leaders, making sure that on one hand, they really look, um, uh, look how they can engage their people, making sure everybody still feels uh, like they belong to the company while they still uh, are comfortable facing the other pressing, sometimes more pressing challenges they currently have. But not to forget that DNI is embedded in everything that we should do or should be embedded in everything we do, going out to our clients, but also looking internally. What do our people require? What do they need? And uh, make that more specific for all these 18 different markets um, because we do have different cultures, people from different nationalities making sure that everybody feels uh, valued and they can be themselves um, uh, while working together. Thank you, Crystal. I think that point about feeling uh, valued is so important and one actually that we are likely to revisit, I would imagine, during the course of this conversation. Um, we're just going to take a moment now to actually ask our audience to tell us where they are. So if I could draw your attention to your Glissa screen that you are looking at at the moment, 
just um, beneath the screen, you'll see a Q&A tab that you'll be able to click on and send your questions through so that during the course of this session, I can pose them to the rest of the panel. And you'll also be able to upvote the questions that you like the most. There's a little thumbs up next to it, and that will help me to understand which are the most popular questions. So be sure to send them in. If you want to direct them to a particular person, just put their name into the question so that I know to direct them. But what we're going to do now is a very quick uh, poll survey to find out which city it is that you are dialing on in from. So if we could have that question brought onto the Glissa screen, that would be great. So which city are you dialing in from? And you'll have the option to type in wherever it is that you are, and that will come up for us in a moment. Whilst those uh, answers are coming in, how was it coming into London today? If anyone found it a little bit different or uh, noticed any changes, Manny, perhaps it's coming back to the workplace for you, really. Yeah, here. absolutely. Um, really exciting, actually. I was really excited to come in. Um, I enjoyed my, my trip into London, um, albeit obviously very different from the last time I was here. Mm. Um, but, you know, as a business, we're, we're all about people. Um, so being able to re-engage and, you know, see my colleagues that I haven't seen for such a long time um, was, yeah, very exciting. And it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be part of the event and, and see you all here too. Good. Well, we've got some uh, answers coming in here. We, USA is a big one, um, which... Last time I checked, it wasn't a city, but I think we'll roll with it. Um, Brighton, uh, Manny, a little closer to you. If you could read out a couple more. Yeah, sure. We've got there. Brooklyn, Mexico, Istanbul, um, Brussels. What have we got? Southampton, Brighton, Yorkshire, York. Wow. Um, Germany, Geneva. Wow, everywhere. Baltimore. Great. So a really diverse uh, yeah. range of where fantastic. people are dialing in from, which is absolutely fantastic to, to know that that's where, where folk are based. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to see where you are. Um, and we're going to crack in now to, to the panel. And the first question that I'm going to pose to each of you, and we'll include Crystal in the answer too, sounds very high level. Um, it sounds like it should be an obvious question, but it seems to be something that companies are continuing to grapple with, which is the difference between diversity and inclusion and how we get them to link together. Uh, and I'd really like to ask each of you to, to talk to this point particularly. What's the difference? Why is this so difficult? Um, Ashanti, over to you first. <laughs> um, so that's a really good question and quite an important one because it really does help an organisation start to think about the practical and tangible things they can do to improve diversity and inclusion. So very simply, diversity in itself is, is, is difference and recognising uh, the differences that may exist between us. And so in a very practical sense, that could be how many women, that could be how many working parents, that could be how many individuals maybe self-identify um, in an agenda. So it's a, the what is the diversity. And then inclusion is a really how we include and create a culture of acceptance, of uh, belonging, as, as it's said very commonly in the US, for each of those groups. And, and it's also, it can be very complex because the reality is, is that each human being has several identities. Mm -hmm. So we can also occupy those identities in different stages in our lives as well. So maybe when we're younger, we might have two or three things that we relate to, and then maybe we, I don't know, get married or we have children, and so suddenly our identity continues to evolve. And so that's really the difference in a very basic way between diversity and inclusion. A classic live events. We're back to <laughs> small, small accidents happening. It's good to know that we're back to it. Um, Manny. Sure. So, so just to echo some of, of that, Shanti. Um, to me, diverse, the difference between um, diversity and inclusion is diversity is understanding the value that comes from having different diverse people on a team, um, the characteristics and traits that make those people unique um, and how that directly links to more creativity, more innovative ideas. Um, and then inclusion for me is how do we, you know, effectively ensure that each of those characters, traits and, and um, people are made to feel included as part of the same, you know, goal 
and how do we ensure that everyone is learning in the best way possible to ensure they're made to feel inclusive along the way. Um, and effectively, that is the, the, the importance of actually having both running at the same time and effectively working at the same time. Because I think you can do one or the other well, but it's actually incredibly important for me that we have more conversation around the, the fact and the importance of doing both well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just sort of carrying on from, from your points, I probably have used diversity and inclusion together separately and incorrectly many times. Um, so when I use those words, what I'm thinking about is the action-oriented nature of probably the inclusion side, mm -hmm. more of it, which is the, okay, if I have a perspective or an understanding of diversity and the impacts of different types of diversity, what am I going to do about it? What is my business going to do about it? Um, what are my colleagues going to do to participate in that? So I normally am thinking in terms of being on the front foot and doing something about bringing people together, whether it's an event, um, a, a training session, or something to broaden out understandings or connecting people. So I, I think ultimately the two words work together because the, the basic understanding is useful. However, actioning that and, and moving it forward in a plan or a program is really where we can all make a difference and, and use the power of diversity to, to be stronger in what we do as well as what our businesses do. It's a really good point that pulling it together into an action and a plan, mm -hmm. um, as well as having the concept, and we had the word value coming up as well then uh, too. So if we go over to Crystal now, that would be fantastic. Crystal, if we could get your thoughts on this particular point. Yeah, of course. Well, um, to build up on uh, what you already mentioned, I think the inclusion part is, is, the, is, is the more challenging and the, the harder part for companies to grasp. Um, I think inclusion is very much having the people that you work with or people working within your firm, that they are comfortable, that they are um, really comfortable to let them, their voices to be heard, um, that they're comfortable to bring their whole selves and also comfortable to be the best of themselves. Um, I think having a diverse workforce is, is very much based on um, having people from different backgrounds, different values, different experiences. But inclusion is bringing all those values, backgrounds, and experiences together while making sure these people are comfortable to bring themselves, their whole selves, and their best selves. Um, when I first started working with Indy and I, somebody explained it to me in a very uh, simple yet funny and effective way. And uh, the quote was literally, diversity is inviting everybody to the party, mm -hmm. and inclusiveness is also inviting everybody to the dance floor. Yeah. So really getting them yeah. to the party so everybody has that fun and best experience where, you know, the party happens and that's at the event. Yeah. So that's something I try to keep in mind as much as possible when talking about uh, the uh, definitions of DNI. No, I love that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And also the thought of going to a party right now is very exciting too. But um, <laughs> Crystal, another question to you specifically. Um, as this is very much your area of expertise, why are we still having to ask this question uh, in 2020? So this feels like a question that we should have a clear answer to and companies should have made more progress with, and yet so many still seem to be struggling. And you don't have to look far to find articles about how companies are still struggling with the difference between diversity and inclusion and actually then building a plan that takes this forward. What are your thoughts on that, Crystal? Well, um, I think to a lot of companies, the business case of DNI is very clear. So I am happy to see that more and more companies um, are bringing out that they understand why DNI is so important to embrace within their companies. Um, but I think it's sometimes it can be an uncomfortable conversation to have internally. Um, DNI consists of so many different perspectives and so many different um, areas that you have to explore. Uh, and that brings about, oh, that might bring about several different uncomfortable conversations or situations that people are really trying to be um, um, a little bit political about. Um, so I can imagine that it has to be something that we keep on exploring. We can't expect everybody to um, um, have an answer ready because DNI consists of so many different uh, aspects. Um, 
but that's it's a journey we're there to explore it further and further and still keep it high on our agenda mm-hmm. um and that's why it's so, so important to keep uh having these uh, uh conversations Yes, absolutely. And you have unknowingly segued beautifully into the next question that is actually going to be going out to all of our attendees, which is around this concept of having uncomfortable conversations. Because when you take all of the different aspects of diversity, age, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, the list really does go on. Religion is another one, and I'm, I've definitely not covered them all yet. It's, it's inevitable that along the way, everybody is probably going to encounter something that makes them feel uncomfortable um, when having these really important conversations. I think it was Brené Brown who said something along the lines of avoiding feeling uncomfortable during diversity conversations is the definition of being privileged or something along those lines. And yet we still seem to find this is something that holds these conversations back. So the next poll question that we're going to ask out to the audience members to answer, and this again will just come up on your screen and you can select which you are you feel is most appropriate for your company, is which, uh, how comfortable is your company with having these difficult conversations, these uncomfortable conversations? And if you could take that vote whilst we um, have a, a brief ongoing conversation. <laughs> Darren, you have seen inside many companies uh, during your career. Why do you think it is that these uncomfortable conversations just seem so hard to, to keep having on a consistent basis? I mean, a, a company is just a collection of people. And as individuals inside a company, I think people are just at the root of it. They feel uh, afraid. There's a little bit of fear there for saying the wrong thing, experiencing a reaction. Um, nobody wants to make anybody else feel bad. They're worried about you know, the impact of, of um, saying something that might be not on point with how that person perceives their reality. And I, I think that the more a business can create a culture of learning and understanding that every person in the company is on a learning journey, you can broaden out those conversations to maybe minimize some of the impacts of um, the reactions that people are worried about experiencing. Mm. Um, I don't know if you have some thoughts no, on think, that as well, Shanti. No, I think you've covered that well, and I'd, I'd just add to that that you know the process of upskilling people to have good mm. conversations. That is what organizations at the root of it need to work on because there are many conversations that aren't always pleasant to have. Yeah. If you think about appraisals and, and, and you know pay rises, those are conversations that can um, consist of tension and apprehension on the part of managers. And so it's about upskilling ourselves in general with having uncomfortable conversations. And so difficult, more difficult conversations about race, about age, etc., and including people become easier. How do you have conversations that lead people feeling valued and heard but also are productive because at some point we have to accept that maybe we need to do something differently Mm -hmm. and that might make some people feel uncomfortable there's there's something that kind of underpins that around intention Mm. you you can accept a lot uh, from someone else who who's sort of acknowledging that they're on a journey if you can see their intention if their Mm. intention is to be inclusive understand learn you can accept a lot about sort of uh, language that they're using or responses that they're having if you believe that their intention is to understand. Yeah. And I think if, if, you, if businesses can create a playing field that allows those intentions to be surfaced, you can be productive. Mm. You can open up conversations. And these days, you know, a lot of DNI initiatives focused on employees and your work colleagues, but it's becoming more broader than that with suppliers and customers, yes. communities and stakeholders. So the complexity is actually rising. Yes. So that playing field, I think, is more and more important to mm. just let people have a conversation and learn in the process. Yeah, and have that conversation facilitated. Mm, that's right. Good, I yeah. think that's a challenge that a lot of organizations struggle with because often you're using internal employees to chair these conversations conversations and that isn't always helpful because there are these kind of as crystal alluded to sometimes political dynamics and so to have your peer chair a conversation mm. about something so important is not always helpful mm. so if you can engage um you know external facilitators who are versed in 
becoming almost shock absorbers as well. And so sometimes the fallout from those conversations, they can be diverted to your facilitator as opposed to each other. It's something that we say, you know, troubleshoot the problem, not each other. Mm. And by engaging right. an external facilitator enables you to open up those conversations in a brave way, bearing in mind your workplace may not be safe for everyone. Um, Manny, would I be able to ask you to just share the results as they're right in front of you? The, the, there's a very hefty weighting into blue. <laughs> there is, there is. Um, so 70% have um, come back to say they're getting more comfortable, uh, which is interesting. We then have 14% um, assigned as very comfortable, followed by 9% not that great and 7% not at all. Okay, so that, that's actually really quite encouraging, I mm. think, that such mm -hmm. a large proportion edging into the getting more comfortable. Obviously, we'd like it to be much more in the actually really comfortable, but I do think that's a, a encouraging compared to some uh, studies that I've seen, certainly more recently, heading in the right direction at least. Um, Darren, you mentioned the word fear when you were asking there, and this fear of getting things wrong, and Ashanti, this is something you're <laughs> very passionate about, the... Um, uh, Abraham, um, yeah. yes, the, sorry, Andrew Ibrahim, that's the name <laughs> I'm looking for, the graphic that yes. kind of went viral a couple of months ago, um, which I think has just come up now as well. So this is the concept of moving through the phases from fear to learning to growth. Mm. Um, and it sounds like maybe we're edging a little bit into the learning mm. zone. Well, yeah, it, it takes time to get into the learning zone because there's awareness, there's accountability, that's what really takes us into the learning zone organisationally, but also as individuals as well. But it, and it also, you have to be brave. You, you have to be willing to say, actually, I don't know about this. I wasn't aware mm. of the impact of this. And now I would like to learn. Can you, can you teach me? Um, and that can be very difficult, particularly for senior leaders and, um, you know, leaders, because they're not, that's not really what they're meant to do. They're meant to be leading. Mm. So to be put in a situation where they have to acknowledge maybe that they don't know the answer or they were yeah. unaware of a problem in their organisation is quite a challenge. Yeah. Uh, do you remember talking to a um, managing director, director of business once? He thought he was doing a really great job and he said he had a, a bit of an epiphany moment when somebody came to talk to him yeah. and said, actually, you're not, and realised that by not thinking there was a problem, he just mm. neglected to observe where he was making failings. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah, recognising when there's a need for change as well. That's an interesting point also right now because I think during you know, lockdown in the months and then the nature of diversity, we've had different things shown to us. We've had a few different types of being different shown to us that maybe weren't at the top of the list before. So diversity changes. You may think you've got, you know, one type of diversity nailed and then something will change and you've got to change your language yes. and change how you operate with it. So I think just keeping that openness to the fact that you have to be observant, you have to be observing and thinking and um, aware of people. In mm, absolutely, and I think there's a great opportunity, you know, especially for senior leaders, if they do some of this work privately and discreetly as executive groups, it enables you to explore and work through the fear zone, a bit of the learning zone, mm. and then you can come back to your organisation and say, hey, this is what we've learned and this is what we'd now like to do with you. Yep. It's just a shame sometimes that, you know, we've seen on social media, you know, Past employees, current employees might feel disgruntled because what they're seeing isn't necessarily uh, the same as what they're, mm -hmm. they're experiencing. And so a good way of avoiding that is really to take stock and take that time as a senior team to explore your own journeys yeah. when it comes to any ism mm -hmm. across all diversity <laughs> and inclusion so that you can come out as a leader in this regard as well and really build trust with your employees because they see that you're human, you're vulnerable as well. Um, and when they trust you, then they're likely to respect you on that journey. Yeah. This is such Very a great optimal. model as well, I have to say, we were talking about this briefly before we came on, um, both from an individual perspective and also an organisational perspective. Yeah. Um, it's just a great starting point to, to, to initiate conversations around D&I. Yeah, well, you're both touching on future <laughs> points that we'll be coming to as well, so like I primed you or something. We've had quite a lot of questions come in, um, which is fantastic. And I'm going to ask Crystal, actually, uh, if we could take one of the questions from the 
uh, audience, I was going to say from the floor, these are from the virtual <laughs> audience. Um, Crystal, yeah. this question is, do you think BAME needs to be redefined as it erases diversity by lumping many diverse groups into one category? So should BAME be redefined because actually it's pulling together a lot of diverse groups and not differentiating them? What are your thoughts on that? Good question, first of all. Um, I think there's no yes or clear yes or no answer. Um, I think this is something, again, to, especially within your own company, to have a conversation with the different people, uh, the people from different backgrounds, and ask them how they would prefer to be um, addressed. We have so many different acronyms and groups and networks, um, and I think we really need to dig deep and have the conversation and ask people what makes them most comfortable when do they feel like um, they are being heard and they can be their best uh, at their best um, so to answer the question I don't have a clear yes or no um, but I do believe that if uh, if someone ha has a question or they might feel uncomfortable being addressed as a BAME colleague um, have that conversation and see if other people feel the same way and from there on, uh, seek a, uh, a, a way of addressing that works for everybody or that might uh, have people feeling more comfortable if they do not like the, uh, the acronym or the, the term uh, uh, thing. Okay. And yeah. Crystal, we'll, uh, we'll keep you on whilst you're, you're with us directly. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to another question, which I'll then also put to some of the other panellists. The question is, what tasks or procedures can I implement to help my team focus on DNI on a daily basis. And I think that's the really crucial bit here. So tasks and procedures to implement that will help the team focus on a daily basis on DNI. Crystal, thoughts on that? Right. Well, my advice would be to keep it as simple as possible. Um, really, especially during um, pressing times like these where there are very uh, much uh, high challenges or questions or requirements coming from clients, really try to keep uh, the actions very simple and um, um, very tangible uh, while, while talking with your colleagues. For example, very um, easy things that we try to do now in our own team and we're encouraging others in our own, in our uh, region to do that as well. Before or at the start of every meeting, before we go to the content, Let's spend five or 10 minutes just having a conversation on how everybody is feeling, just to get an idea of um, what is going on in the other's life. That's very much on a piece of, on, of diversity. Not everybody is working full time. Some people have other uh, challenges going on at home. How do we make sure that everybody is feeling okay, have that conversation, uh, dig deep to see how is that other people, how is that other person doing and are they comfortable uh, today, tomorrow, during this week, um, to be their best selves. Um, such really small things to check in regularly with each other, really dig deep to see how someone else is doing, could really enhance that feeling of inclusiveness within a team. And it's very easy, uh, uh, very tangible. And speaking from my own experiences, it really um, feels good to have the feeling of belonging and knowing that, that people care about you as a person. Um, when asking such, well, easy uh, questions. Thank you, Crystal. You make it sound so organic, which I think for you it may well be. For a lot of people, it's probably more challenging, but it's actually great to hear it communicated in such a natural way. Um, there's a question that's come up a couple of times around the slide, the, the, the graphic that we showed. If you click download just below, you'll be able to get a copy of that after the event has finished. So if you want that, just click the download button and you'll be able to get it. I'm going to take one more question from this before we do another poll. Um, and Darren, I'm going to put this one to you. So this is how many employees in smaller companies without HR teams, or sorry, how many employees in smaller companies without HR teams um, or without DNI? existing in already, how can they navigate having these uncomfortable conversations? And given your experience with startups, you might have some thoughts there. Um, even, I mean, large organizations, 
do have dedicated functions for diversity and inclusion, but they also have mm. employee-led initiatives to take a more grassroots stakeholder um, approach to driving diversity and inclusion and specific resource groups. So for startups or scale-up companies, you can take matters into your own hands and form a working group uh, find a partner in crime in, in the business and start to gather up your topics. Um, one of the groups I was involved with when I used to work for SAP, we started several um, subgroups as well to focus on specific topics. And that was entirely driven by the volunteers, um, by people who were interested in those topic areas. So you don't really have to wait for your company to do anything or establish an employee in an HR department. If there's something you think could help your company, help your colleagues, help your customers, help your distributors and partners and so forth, do better business and talk to their customers a little bit better, you can find lots of uh, resources that can help you do that in terms of starting conversations. Ashanti, you probably know about a lot of um, <laughs> sort of cost-free yeah. levels of content, but the, the point I'm trying to make is you, you, you don't need it to be someone's job, you can make it an interest that will help your business. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I do agree for the most part with that. I think the challenge is when you leave it down to individuals to do this mm -hmm. work, again, maybe as an organization, you don't see that kind of harmonious yeah. um, progress that you want to see. So I, I definitely agree with you in terms of a starting point. I do think, however, though, it is important for organizations to set the tone from mm -hmm. the top. And that may at times mean they need to invest in some kind of training, whether it's recorded training or it's yeah. live training, just to set the tone from the top as to what we expect from you. Because it can be quite challenging otherwise, because people literally come to work, we all do really, with our own ideas, beliefs, biases. And unless we have a way of challenging and addressing those in a coordinated way, sometimes we might be unaware as senior management, for example, what's happening in the team. So I, I definitely think yeah. um, what you said is really useful as a starting point, mm -hmm. but organisations who can should think about doing something structured and facilitated. To find, finding some connective tissue yes. from the people who yeah. have used their initiative to yes. start something, but also connected into some sort of champion yes. or leader on, on some level so yeah. that you, you get that connectivity from the interests of the, the people with the interests yeah. of the business. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, because it's a complex, this is a complex, such a broad topic. Yeah, so yes. complex, right? And some of the things that Crystal described that they're doing at EY, for example, you know, that's individual work. So what you're asking is for managers and colleagues to care about each other. So there's, there's the layers are that what, what is required from an organization to set that tone from the top? And then what do we expect our individual colleagues and employees to do? And unfortunately for organizations, they have to facilitate both layers of yeah. work. And so there's the, the things that need to be done on an organizational level to set the tone, to embed it in performance, in expectations from each other. And then what facilitation of that individual work? Because we can't legislate people's hearts and minds, right? And given it's a journey, we, we also sometimes have to find a way of touching somebody as an individual and helping them understand what their colleague might be going through. Yeah. To kind of tie in what you were saying just now to a point Crystal made earlier about the business case for mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion, for a startup or scale-up that's trying to build a global business for whatever the roadmap uh, of their tra trajectory is going to be, the business case is also clear for them. Is mm. If you can embrace these types of practices and create this playing field, you'll facilitate that plan of, of building a global business. So there is connective tissue even in mm -hmm. a smaller business, um, a business that's growing, as well as a, a corporate where it's very much a mandate they have to have for their shareholder base and what have you. Great, that's a really thorough answer actually to that, which is great, because I think there are an awful lot of companies out there actually trying to do better without HR and without teams that are allocated to this. So I, I hope that's spoken to, to some of our viewers. We're going to take another poll now. And um, Ashanti, you sort of touched on this then, uh, that there are many different complexities to this. And this is to ask our viewers what challenges they have for progressing DNI conversations. And this is a ranking poll, actually. So there are five options that you'll be uh, able to see. And you can use the arrows 
to vote these up and vote them down. So take a moment to, to do that. And I realize there are options well beyond this list of five, but um, we're trying to keep it concise because I can see we're going to struggle to keep to time today already. So whilst the results from that are, are coming in, um, just a, a quick conversation between us. It's felt like there's been some very positive momentum gathering over the last couple of months. Um, as a result of various world events that have happened. Um, but as well as the positives, there's also been some negatives. And I thought it'd be interesting, just in a minute each maybe, Manny, perhaps you could summarise for us a, a positive that you've seen uh, and that you feel over the last six months in the DNI movement. Sure. Um, I think for me the most um, impactful positive from all of this and recent events is... Um, heightened collaboration. So I think, um, you know, it's encouraged individuals, organisations at, you know, domestic and international levels to work together where they normally wouldn't have worked together, mm -hmm. to have conversations when they wouldn't normally have had conversations. And I think my team are a prime example of that. Um, you know, historically, I would normally sit down with my sales team to have a conversation around sales initiatives and, you know, plans of action. Um, but now, um, you know, that, that conversation is now inclusive of my head chef and my f &B team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just the, the nature of how things have progressed and clearly in the right direction. Um, but it just draws on to, you know, bringing in more diverse conversations, um, bringing in thinking outside the box, really, you know, which is what a lot of organisations and individuals have had to do in a very short space of time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, on the negative side as well, Ashanti, it's not mm -hmm. all, it doesn't all smell of roses, unfortunately. Uh, what, what have you seen on that side? Yeah, I mean, we had this chat, didn't we, Vanessa? I think it's really important, despite what we're seeing on social media, for example, um, to still keep doing the work internally in our organisations. A lot of the emails and messages that I get daily um, are, are, you know, experiences of individuals in workplaces who are experiencing some really challenging situations. And so, um, for me, as a practitioner, it's really important that we keep doing more than just talking about it, but we see organisations put things in place to make people feel more included so that they can do their job better, ultimately, right? This is about creating a kind of healthy, happy workplace for everyone. Um, and so I would say... Um, it's, it's even for senior leaders not to necessarily um, be influenced by some of the things we're seeing on social media or maybe you've done a survey and you think, oh, this has gone up by a couple of points. It's to keep digging deeper, I think, to make sure that you're actually making progress internally. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So well, this is quite um, well spread, actually, the mm. results that we've got here, perhaps more so than I was expecting. Um, not that I had a particular idea in mind of how they would, would end up. Um, Darren, your thoughts on these results so far? I think we probably have a pretty broad uh, group of participants today coming from different industries and parts of the world yep. and different sizes of business. So th this even distribution is probably pretty accurate mm. for kind of the, the viewpoints. Yep. Um, we have a diverse audience today, <laughs> and so we're getting maybe some balanced responses here. Yeah, this is true. So I guess what this uh, suggests is whatever you feel your personal challenge is, the greatest one, you're, you're clearly in company. <laughs> um, and there's not one that's outstripping the others, which is a good thing, I would say, probably overall. Um, we've still got a whole load of questions coming in. Um, and there's one here which I think... Um, we can take a quick look at, which is around gender, particularly. Mm. Uh, so the observation, this is an all-female panel. Yep. Uh, I will say there was a gentleman who was very keen to be involved. He had a baby arrive early and absolute respect that he is now doing the right thing and spending time <laughs> with his family. Um, but this is a, a very interesting point that it, it is often women who are having these conversations. Um, and... Ideally, we would be making it truly diverse and truly mm. inclusive by having male participation too. Um, thoughts on this? In fact, Crystal, let's bring Crystal back into to the party. Um, Crystal, what are your thoughts on this? Can you repeat the question, please? I just that's all right. A bit of a glitch. So we have this is an all female panel, and ideally, we would have more male voices involved right. in the conversation. Um, how do we make that happen? <laughs> Good one. Well, uh, <laughs> um, well, I think this is this is so a typical, I guess, a, typical, a good 
a very typical uh, uh, pressing question within the field of inclusiveness. Um, if we want to have more females or more males, I think we need to put more attention to it. Um, we have a uh, bit on the female and male uh, balance. We are very much to the female side. So if we if we would like to have more males in this uh, light of this event, um, place more attention to it, talk about it, uh, and reach out extra to them so they feel empowered to be part of the conversation and not feel scared because it's a panel full of uh, full of females. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant question, actually, because what's very interesting, just very briefly, is that um, the workplace really was originally designed for a certain man of a certain generation anyway, right? And that generation of male has also, you know, slowly <laughs> disappeared from the workplace because we're now in 2020. And actually, the workplace is not working for men either. And that is something that does need to be really unearthed. And I think by really digging deeper on diversity and inclusion, it will make the workplace even better for who we perceive to be at the top of the tree, which often we talk about white males. But actually, it's not great for them if we think about things like paternity leave, for example, mm. or maybe flexible working. Um, those are still challenges that they're experiencing in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. So to your point about kind of, again, demonstrating more diversity in the diversity conversation, it is about, from my experience working with organisations, providing these brave spaces for senior males to have conversations about what they're finding challenging and then empowering them maybe to be vulnerable enough to talk about that in their organisation. Mm -hmm. And then maybe with time, you'd have more males who'd be willing to come out publicly and, and engage and, and somewhat lead the conversation about how we can make the workplace more inclusive for everyone. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take another poll. That would be our last poll of the day. And then after that, we will have time if any of our audience members in the room would like to ask a question, we will have time for one of those um, if we're very quick because <laughs> we are running quite short on time. So the last poll of the day is actually around you personally and how comfortable you personally feel around having these uncomfortable conversations. Um, same sorts of options that you'll have, very comfortable, mid down to, to not very comfortable yet. And I really encourage you to be very honest with your response here about how comfortable you truly feel, because I think it would be interesting to see the difference between personal um, feelings on this and company sentiment as well. So whilst that um, poll is coming through, there is a question as well, which I think is very interesting. Um, and it's around the seniority of hires. So very often diversity quotas, forgive me for using the phrase, but it's used often, are filled at the junior and mid-level. Mm -hmm. And actually the challenge really comes at the more senior level. And I I think probably everybody in the working world would agree with that and, and will have seen that and how we counteract that and actually really make adjustments right across the full seniority um, of the workforce. Um, Darren, thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree. A, a number of the corporations that I've worked for in the past have focused a lot of their efforts on early career uh, populations within within their business. But if you do the math in terms of how many years it takes for that mm -hmm. population to progress through the business, it's actually the senior levels where the decisions are being made. And by the time that early career talent makes its way to those levels to influence decision making, it'll be after my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, really robust inclusion programs focus on early talent, mid-career and senior talent programs for for their diverse audience. So I've seen a few really great examples at a few past employers around reverse mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, and those types of things really focus on learning. So back to the diagram we've been referring to, they focus on learning so that the people in senior roles can be influenced by some of these concepts while the early talent is coming through. And the balanced approach is needed if we're gonna actually have some change happen uh, in my work lifetime or in, you know, um, the work lifetime of, of people who are at, say, mid-career stages right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think that's a really great answer and quite levelling as well when you start to really take on board how long this transition could take. Very levelling um, and, you know, not ideal, I think, is probably the 
most gentle way that I could frame how that makes me feel certainly personally. Now, this is quite a different result, actually, um, and really encouraging that a lot more people as individuals feel very comfortable having these difficult conversations compared to the volume when we're talking about at the company level. Mm. Um, for me, I find this uh, an opportunity First and foremost, because I'm a positive person, I try and see the positives here. But it does also frustrate me that, for whatever reason, in a group, we are less able to have these difficult conversations. Um, so there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be done here, but much better that we've got more individuals in the very comfortable level, I feel, than um, at uh, the company level, because we can go, I hope, in the right direction. So we're going to come to closing comments from each of you in a moment. I'm just going to ask for a one minute summary from each of you. Um, and whilst we're doing that, we're going to be running a lottery for our viewers. So as mentioned, we are giving away this platform to DNI professionals, and we're really proud to do that. We would also, at the Glissa team, like to, just for fun, do a consultation with one of our lucky winners from today's um, show, which will be able to have a session with the Glissa team on bringing to life one of their future DNI events, which you may choose to host through Glissa or you may not. But we would like to spend some time with one of you to enable you to really bring your event goals to life because it's something that we feel very passionately about. And despite us being remote at the moment and working in some weird and sometimes wonderful places, we can still keep these conversations going and we'd like to make that happen. Whilst that lottery is running and a person is selected at random, Darren, one takeaway from you from today. Um, I'm taking away the emphasis on learning and being brave enough to ask more questions, the different people that uh, I deal with day to day, not just being about colleagues and coworkers, but customers, ask your customers more questions, your partners, the people you do business with. So my goal for today was really to support this panel through identifying more possibilities and i think i'm taking away more possibilities for learning through asking more questions going forward great manny uh, my takeaway would be that we're, we're clearly in a, clearly in a very unique period of time and dni is a very hot topic of conversation and i think as individuals and organizations we need to take as much responsibility and accountability to ensure that this conversation isn't just a, an August, September mm. 2020 trend. Um, so personally, I want to take more responsibility in terms of my contribution within as an individual and, and as part of the organisation to, to ensure we don't lose momentum on, on this subject. Thank you. Ashanti. Yeah, sure. And I think as the poll results reveal, um, individuals are ready to have this conversation in the workplace. And so I think it's really important that organisations decide to facilitate those conversations yeah. and lead the way when it comes to making changes and moving towards a more happy and healthy workplace. Great. And, and Crystal, if we could draw on you for your one takeaway from today, if you are still with us, I know we're edging towards the end of time. <laughs> I am, I am. Hi. <laughs> Now, what I really find uh, most important is also to look at DNI from a uh, perspective of it's it's a learning opportunity. Um, we learn so much from having conversations with each other and learning from each other. And I think it's really important that everybody uh, feels comfortable to have these conversation conversations and bring their best um, to where they where they are and that others value them for the different perspectives that they bring. Um, one thing I really try to keep in mind all the time is, um, you know, change happens with one small gesture and one moment at a time. Um, we don't always have to take bold and brave, huge steps because sometimes the road uh, is, is a bit unclear. But remind yourself of one small gesture, one small positive conversation or question can bring about a lot of change in somebody else's life or the way somebody else, somebody feels uh, while interacting with you and going uh, beyond that simple, small conversation. That's great. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you to all of our panellists today. We do have our winner, so we'll be in touch after the session, which is Ian Dakuna from Ramsey Health, and we will be in touch to arrange a follow-up session with you if you would like to have it. So to conclude from today, we are really pleased to have been able to continue the conversation 
on DNI in person and virtually. It's very important to us that we really keep this going in the face of hybrid and, and virtual event times. Absolutely brilliant to have had our panelists with us in person, which has really been great to just have been able to sit around beforehand and talk about things in a, a very, uh, it's natural on video calls, but it's more natural in person. I think it's safe to say. And Crystal, huge thanks for joining us as well remotely from Amsterdam. Very much appreciated. Once again, a big thank you to Etc. Venues and to Love Days AV. Thank you all of you for joining us in person and also virtually. And we'll be doing more of this in the future. We hope to keep in touch. Thank you very much.